Good morning, campers and all other persons. I want to wish you a happy day. One in which you will be well blessed. And while you are there looking at me, in kind of prayer, my throat seems to be playing a stunt on me. But um, I'm sure I have been having some challenges with this camp. <clears throat> anyway, we want to thank God for another day for the opportunity to come together because I personally, as you are fully aware, I personally believe that we are in crucial times and that we need to be made aware of them or kept focused in our mind even as we hear the gospel presented to us that we might understand is not just in a vacuum but it has some kind of a time frame, not that we put on it, but as we allow God to develop and mature us, he will be able to give us the guidance so that we may understand the things that are written for our day. So I encourage you to pay attention. There might be things that appear new to you, but I'm sure by the Spirit of God, because I believe he has shifted my focus in a direct way this couple of days, and um, I had something else to present to continue from yesterday, but I was in the night season of prayer. I was heavily um, impacted to prepare something differently, even though it's not me so far from what we have begun Sabbath and Sunday. So I leave it to God and ask him what he wants to do. Just do it. I'm willing to be his slave. I'm willing to be his just a vessel. Once he gets through, that is my objective by his grace. So as we together pray, may we remember that we are in need of that grace to keep us because we cannot keep ourselves, especially to the times which we've come. Just pause with me as we just ask him to be a teacher. Father, I thank you for your mercies. I claim the promise, dear Lord, that you will deliver me from the stress of the voice and that you make it clear that your word can be presented clearly. Grant your Lord that as we listen, your name might be honored. And <clears throat> okay. Of course, we're at Camp 2015, and my theme is Good Tidings for the Midnight Watch. Good Tidings for the Midnight Watch, and enter part three of Closing Time. Remember, we'd have done part one, parts one and two of Closing Time. This is part three of that. I don't know if another part will appear. I can't tell you that at this time, to be honest and frank with you. All right, um, as I get started out here, we're going to be looking at three eras or areas which we want to pay special attention to. But there's one particular one that we shall start with that we all know the story concerning, but I'm not sure that we are always conscious of that story. It's a fantastic story. And um, <clears throat> I would want to really go in the sequence that I have it sorted out. So we are dealing with the first advent, the issues concerning the first advent, the gospel relative to these issues. And um, one of the first things we want to look at would be a pair or a couple of old people. And the first slide, of course, is here, looking for the consolation, looking for the consolation. You know the story? It's the story of two old people, one woman over 100 years, approximately 110 years old from mean calculation. And then another older man as well. Simeon 
and Anna. When was the last time you read that story? And I'm sure that I would suggest that some people haven't read it in many a year. But it has some tremendous gospel truth in it, even it has some issues relative to what we are discussing here today. So let us go. I say here, they were looking for the consolation of Israel, and this slide says, they knew the sign. <clears throat> and you're going to find something interesting. I, I found it very interesting, actually, that God deals in signs. Though Christ told Israel, no sign shall be given you, he turned around and said, the only sign will be given you is the sign of Jonah. That's amazing. No sign, but a sign. I said to you on Sabbath, I think it was, that only those people who can see will see. And only those who hear will hear. But people argue, we all hear. But Christ is very uh, interesting in what he says. People hear, but they don't hear. They see, but they don't see. And we are going to investigate these two older people for that perspective, first of all, as we make some important connections. So let us turn, therefore, then in our book to Luke, our textbook. We're going to Luke chapter 2, verse 25 to 33. So we're doing some Bible work this morning. First of all, and then of course we're going to do from verse 36 to 38, and we're going to look at Isaiah 7, 10 to 16, so something very interesting. Because you're going to find that only those who see will see. So in Luke chapter 2, then from verse 35, 25 to 33, I read, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Now, I don't want you to lose a word that was just said, because every word is charged. In that verse. Verse 26 says, And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he has seen the Lord's Christ. That's a fantastic promise. You know, imagine God telling a man, you ain't going to die till you see something that you got special. That man has to be walking close and hearing the voice of God and knowing it. But let's go to verse 27. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought the, in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he up in his arms and blessed and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for my eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marvel at those things which were spoken. But we are not ready yet. Let's go to verse 36. Sweet stories in the Bible. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, she was of a great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four score and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gate gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all them that look for redemption in Jerusalem. How do you like those two stories? What do you get from them today? What will God teach, from, uh, teach us from them today? Let us start at the beginning. We are dealing with an old man called Simeon, and I want you to get some important points here. 
It says that he was just and devout. Has that ring a bell or struck a chord in your own mind as yet? Just man, and not only just, he was devout. That is, you can see he was a very devoted person. And to show the devotion, he, like Anna, spent all their time virtually in the temple night and day praying. Wow. How much time do you spend praying? And they were doing it for years. For years, night and day praying. But they were praying towers and objective. They were appearing just blind. Listen carefully. He was praying for the consolation of Israel. What is the consolation of Israel? Of course, he mentions it as we go over a little further. He says in verse 30, For my eyes have seen what? That's the consolation of Israel is praying for. Imagine he was praying to see the Christ child. But let me tell you something. We're going to go to this next verse quick because we must tie it in very quickly. How could he know that this Christ child would have been around? That he could so intently pray for him. It was for years this man was doing this, you know. So how could he have set off? I praying for Christ. I want to see this first, this child. And God confirmed to him, Look, um, Simeon, keep praying, man. You're not going to die till you see my salvation. Now I can see Simeon praying more. Lord, send your salvation because they feel that like I can soon die. So send your salvation. The man was praying night and day for years. But listen to Sim Anna, I have to tie them together. In verse um, 36, you speak of a woman called Anna who was of a great age. And I gave her at least 110 years on average. So here's a real old woman in our estimation who every, listen to the Bible, she departed not from the temple but served God with fasting. It's a woman fasting. You know, people are fasting today. Get too hungry. I can die. But she served God with fastings and prayer. How often, brethren? With this woman, like she ain't eating no food at all. Night and day. And for not just a day, you know. For years, this old woman was doing this. How often or how long have you been praying for any one thing? You know, Christ in Luke chapter 18 says, verse 1, men are always to prayer and not faint. That is, you are to keep your petition before the Lord, never given up. Once you know the objective of that petition is what God has promised. God has promised to save our children. Have you given up on your wayward children who are not walking in the way of the Lord? It means that you do not believe that God's promise is that I will save your children. So you have given up. You start praying. It looks as though they've been doing nothing. They ain't coming. But like God's salvation had its timetable sorted out, each human being responds to God who can't force them, and therefore God sees a timetable on their behalf. But the point is here, these two old people bless my heart. I've been reading about it in recent months and sharing it with persons who meet here with me on Wednesdays for prayer meeting between 11 and 1 o'clock. And we have been having a wonderful times, and this has been a source of encouragement. So, not giving up. It matters not how old you are, and this woman was not less than 100 years old. She was at least 84 years living after her husband died. She was living seven years with him, so that at least, you put on 84 and seven is about 91, and she would not have been married at nine years old. So I calculate she's over at least 110 years old. But that is to say, the woman was elderly, but she never lost focus of the promise of God. But let us go quicker. But look at Simeon. 
If a person tells you today that God tells me I am not going to die until I see Christ revealed in the clouds, you will burst your belly with laugh. He mad, boy. He gone. And I can imagine if Simeon had said that to some of the Israelites back there. They will, he's a foolish old man. You know how you, how you treat old people? Most people. You know, he, he old now so much. He's sinner. So, so he know what we're talking about. But the man was a devout man who God blessed. And listen, the Holy Ghost was upon that man. You see the lessons that are coming out here from this little piece of a thing? And therefore, his prayers were answered, and God made a promise to Simeon. I like that. But let's look at Isaiah chapter 7, verse 10 to 16, and see why Simeon and Anna were praying as intent as they were. You know, they weren't praying just blank, you know. They knew something that the others seemed to have forgotten. Go there with me. Isaiah chapter Seven or nine? That's like nine. I need to make a mistake. Is it seven? <clears throat> I put seven there. Nine just flashed in my mind for some reason. All right. In Isaiah chapter seven, we shall read from verse 10 to verse 16. That's correct. And I want you to get this as well because you're going to tell me whether or not those people knew why they should be praying at this time. I want to know if you know why and what you should be praying for at this time. Verse 10. Moreover, the Lord, sorry, moreover, the Lord spake again to Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign, I tell you God deals in signs. And as I've been speaking, it's developing in my mind. There are some signs that I believe that I will be looking at. It hasn't yet crystallized. So as I even speak to you now, some things are flashing around there. Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But it has said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Verse 13. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you what? Tell us that we deal with bear signs. I hope you are seeing the sign. Behold what? A virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Is that the sign that Simeon and Anna saw? I say no. Let's go further. Butter and honey shall he eat that he may, not, he may know how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. I say to you, you haven't seen the sign as yet, but there is the sign that Anna and Simeon saw. Do you see the sign yet, brethren? Oh, look at how our people have the word in front of them and don't see the sign. I stop there. Verse 16, I read it again, that you might see the sign. For before the child shall know how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. And therefore, what is the sign? The sign that Anna and Simeon knew that God's salvation was on the horizon or virtually alive was that Israel had no king at that time. Who was ruling Israel then? The Romans. And they knew once a foreign power had overtaken Israel, the consolation of Israel has to be around in order to bring the deliverance to God's people. Those that sit in darkness will see a great light. I say to you, this is the sign that they saw that many did not see and some of us didn't even recognize it. It's important to know God's signs. And I'm not talking about airy fairy signs. I'm talking about the signs that God gives, that he gives his people. So there is Anna and Simeon, two old people, who knew that there was a sign. 
they study the writings of the prophets. They were not living in Isaiah's time. They were living just at the time of Messiah's birth. So it meant they had the scrolls, which you call the Old Testament, to search. And they searched it just like the Magi searched and saw that there was some king being born. These people searched and found out. And I'm saying to us, brethren, with passion, as you know, you need to be searching to find out where you are and the sign that you are given so that you can know deliverance is at hand. But that is another statement that we will go. So let's go a little further. But there's so much on Anna and Simeon that I like to talk about it, but I can't exhaust all my time because it's almost gone already. That is a sign of the fear of the enemy. The next thing I want to go to, really, is not very dissimilar to these people. It is one that you also know, a story, and in these stories <clears throat> are brought out these several signs. There's some problem obviously going on. And also, we are talking about looking for the time, the experience of Daniel. Now, Daniel was given both a sign with time. Daniel was given a sign with time as well. And we want to look at Daniel. We compare with what happened with Anna and Simeon and see that really knowing the word of God helps you to know the signs and the times. You see, if Anna and, and Simeon did not know the word of God, they could not have known this sign. Would you agree with me, believers? If they did not know the word, they could not have known the sign. Let's look at Daniel a little bit. Now, Daniel is interesting. You've heard about Daniel a lot, but it has a lot of stuff in it. Now, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, and we're not going to take up everything, but I'm just going to highlight these important issues relative to the sign that is already given. You see, Scripture says that the Lord God will do nothing except he does what? He reveals his secret to whom? Let me tell you something. The prophets have revealed God's secrets to us already, brethren. Our problem is we don't search the writings of the prophets to find the secret of God in signs and times and in the gospel to use that expression. But in Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, let's listen to this one. It says, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by what? What does that mean? He was studying the word of God. You can't understand by books. I'm not studying the word. So he was studying the word of God. And again, Daniel was studying the prophets. Listen to him again. Whereof the word of the Lord came to whom? Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So the man of God, like Anna and Simeon, studied the prophets and knew that a time frame or that something important was about to occur. I ask you again, are you so in, enter in the word of God that you know what is about to happen just now? That's the challenge I put to this camp again this day. We learn from Samuel, Simeon and Anna. We're going to learn from Daniel. But are we going to learn an actual fact for ourselves? Okay. So therefore then, where did he get it from? He said Jeremiah. Let's go to Jeremiah. I am showing you, brethren, that God has put in his word all the signs that his people need to know. And these are just simple illustrations. Jeremiah chapter 25, beautiful text, verse 12. Uh, you can read probably the, the other couple of verses, but I just read verse 12 because you have to read how Babylon was going to take him over. Verse 12 says, and it shall come to pass, reign how many years? Seventy years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldees, 
and will make it perpetual desolation. And these 70 years were relative to the captivity of Israel by Nebuchadnezzar. Of course, Daniel was in that first wave of captivity. And therefore, Daniel, searching the word, found out that Nebuchadnezzar had a time frame to do what he had to do. So he knew the sign. The sign was the time. I say he knew the sign. The sign in this instance was the time. He knew the time was 70 years, and he understood and calculated and realized, you know what? The time is about expired. And what do we hear in Daniel chapter 9? Look at the next verse now, verse 3 of Daniel 9. It says, and I prayed unto the Lord my God. Sorry, verse 3 says, after he discovered it, what he did? And I set my face unto the Lord God to see how? By prayer and what else? Supplication and what else? Fastings with sackcloth and ashes. So like Simeon and Anna, fasting and prayers were the part of Daniel. Brethren, are you convinced? Do you know the sign that God has given us? And are you as urgent as these people, seeing that the sign is about fulfilled? Or because you know this, don't know the sign, you're so lax. And therefore, you don't bother too much. I say to us, brethren, God has given signs for his people. Not to walk about saying, I have the sign. But that it will drive us to earnest prayer and fastings and supplications that our souls might be drawn out after him. Our characters might be cleansed as we surrender to Christ. So that the reality is our characters, our souls, our cultivated tendencies to sin being given up. God can now fill us with his own life and live his life in us to victory. That is what all these things are, about, are for, you know. Not merely for you to know that, hey, it can happen, but it might drive you to prayer, fastings, and supplication. That is what you see in every instance here. Simeon and Anna, prayer, fasting, supplication, night and day. Here's Daniel, prayer, fasting, and supplication because of this. I spent three weeks, whew, three weeks, and almost without any, he said, pleasant food. Because he wanted to know something on another matter. How does our church stack up with Daniel and old people, Simeon and Anna, uh, Hannah, uh, Anna, sorry? How do you stack up as an individual in your experience? Well, that was Anna, that was Simeon, that was Daniel. Uh, Sister Carissa, um, if you could physically do she knows more than this. But then we're going to go a little further. We're looking at signs. And like I said to you, notice that God functions with signs. I now want to read something to you from Luke chapter 2, 25 to 33 and 36 to 38. If you can't see it good, you have your Bibles. I call it what you read earlier, the Simeon and Anna experience. The Simeon and Anna go a little further. Experience. We read that just now. Also, we realize that the Simeon and Anna experience was based on the word of God. I want to emphasize that. Therefore, these people would not just wait and say, I feel like the Messiah coming. But they were sure from scriptures, the Messiah is already in the land because there is no king that belongs to Israel or Judah. Therefore, he has to be here. Go against this. Likewise, Daniel, I call it Daniel experience. Daniel, again, from the word of God, saw that 70 years was about to elapse. From, of course, probably the time as a 70-year-old boy who was taken down into Babylon. And we are told that he apparently died in his 90s or whatever whenever it was. But the point is, the word of God had the answer for the man. And I'm emphasizing this, brethren, is the word of God that has every answer for us and every sign that we can follow. Go again, sister. And there was that sign. You have that one. 
to 70 years. Okay, go now as we get a little closer home. There were some signs before the destruction of Jerusalem. Great controversy. You know what we've been studying Matthew 24? Lots of signs. But there were some signs that preceded the major sign for escape. And what it says on page 30, signs and wonders appeared foreboding disaster and doom in the midst of the night an unnatural light shone over the temple and the altar. Upon the clouds at sunset were pictured chariots and men of war gathering for battle. The priests ministering by night in the sanctuary were terrified by mysterious sounds. The earth trembled and a multitude of voices were heard, were heard crying, let us depart hence. And that was before the destruction of Jerusalem. And you know there was a man walking about for seven years saying, Woe, woe unto Jerusalem. And the people scoff and laugh and they treat him bad. And he died in the conflagration. Go ahead. But then again, there was a sign given for the escape. So that you didn't get trapped. You know this text I've been sharing with you. When we see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place, or stand where it ought not, or the armies surrounding Jerusalem, know that the time is at hand. Listen to Ellen White again. This is the, with Jerusalem. Just refresh us, as it were. Page 30 again. Not one Christian perish in the destruction of Jerusalem. Why do you say to that? And why do you say amen? Because God showed them a sign, and they used the sign for the escape. You know the sign that God showed them? Let's go. It says further. Christ had given his disciples what? Warning. And all who believe his word watch for what? What they watch for, believers? So in the warning was a sign. There was a sign given, and they watched for it. I want to just engage you quickly because time is... I heard the whistle just now. Do you know the sign that has been given to you? Do you know a sign has been given to you? Do you know it? Let me go further quickly. He says, quoting um, Matthew 20, For when shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, said Jesus, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Listen to her then. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. So once you see that sign, it's time to bolt. Of course, the sign was just about a year or so over a year when the first Roman wave went back and then Titus came. But by the time he came for the destruction, they had gone. They had escaped because they believed the word of God and they had watched for the sign and the sign was given. She says that after the Romans on the Cestus had surrounded the city, they unexpectedly abandoned the siege when everything seemed favorable for an immediate attack. Wasn't that God's providence? As Christ guided them, I will tell you when to run. I tell you, brethren, if you're not looking for the sign, you're not going to see it. Go on, but looking for it doesn't mean you understand it or even recognize it. Listen to what she says again here, page 31. The besieged Despairing of successful resistance were on the point of surrender. That is the Jewish nation. When the Roman general withdrew his forces before the least apparent reason. The least apparent reason. But God has a reason for it. And this is what trapped them. It was withdrawn. Therefore, oh, our city is safe. We run them out. Yeah, we can rejoice now because we are safe. Listen to that statement. But God's merciful providence was directing events for the good of whom? For the good of whom, brethren? His own people. That is, the people who see and see. The people who hear and hear. They call the people who see and don't see, and they hear and do not hear. So God's people are those who hear and hear. That is, hear and understand. So in actual fact, it is to understand what is spoken that we can escape. 
She says further, the promised sign had been given to the Levitian Christians. And now an opportunity was afforded for all who would to obey the Savior's warning. There's a whole sermon right inside that. Obedience is what God designed in order for us to escape destruction. If you don't obey, destruction will come upon our heads. And then she says, events were so overruled, overruled, sorry, that neither Jew nor Romans should hinder the fight of the Christians. So God had this thing well organized. For all eternity, God saw what was going to happen and sought his people out. He did it with Hannah, Anna, and Simeon. He did it with Daniel. And now he did it with Israel in the time of the, the besiegement of Jerusalem. Go, Chris, because I see. Good. Now, there are some signs before the destruction of the world. You know those signs, fantastic. I have no difficulty with that. You can go ahead a little further. But there's a sign given for the escape of God's people at this time. Do you know it? Do you know that there's a sign that has been written down for God's people willing to escape? Do you read the prophets? I said prophets or inclusive. Do you know the sign? All right. Go there further, sister. Understanding the sign. Listen to the sign that you might not have been aware of that will be given. And if you're not in commune with the eternal God, you will see it, but you won't understand it, and you wouldn't be able to escape. Listen to this sign, and see if it's some sign to you. When you therefore shall see, that, that comes from um, the book called Maranatha, page 172, I think it is, Maranatha. When you therefore shall see the sign spoke of, see the sign spoke of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountain. Listen to what? And now, you see how that text is used. Because Matthew 24 is a dual prophecy, it was applied to AD 70 situation, and it's also applied to our situation by the prophet. Listen to what she says now. The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek our refuge in desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Romans was the signal for a flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation, as the United States, in the decree enforcing papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. Listen to her. It will then be the time to leave the large cities, preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes and secluded places among the mountains. Do you see any sign mentioned there? Believers, do you see any sign mentioned there? The word is signal. And don't get afraid. And signal is also a sign. When I signal to you, I'm signing to you in actual fact. So what God's servant is saying, and I want to impart something here. When you see this particular signal, just as you see a signal back then, be aware that it's time to get away from the congested cities of the world. That's the first thing. Israel were to run out of Jerusalem physically. God's people are to get out of the large cities immediately. Once you see that happens. But you know something? Seeing many people will not see. And we'll ask you the question, we are running so hard about, were things pretty cool? But you would have seen and understood the sign. And we don't hear, brethren, why we don't have large cities to run from, we will know in actual fact, hey, it is time now for trouble to break loose upon the heads of God's people. And therefore, having been prepared before, you would intensify your, your supplication and your prayer and your fasting like Anna and Simeon, like Daniel, and like the disciples at the time of Christ's advent, at the time, sorry, of the destruction of Jerusalem. So this is a significant point. Many Adventists nowadays are waiting 
until this happened to get ready. Let me tell you something. The way that happened is time to run. Israel is told, if you find a house talk, and you see the people surrounding Jerusalem, don't even go in your house for nothing. As soon as the thing break, run. Of course, it took a year. But what Christ was telling them, it is so urgent. Do not lapse and fall into the trap that, oh, well, you know what? The people are going back. So, you know what? We can now relax. And brethren, many things have been said to us. But that sign come when it may, according to the prophet, many people will not understand it. They will see it, but they will not understand it. Because they would not have accepted the word of the prophet on it. And I'm saying to believers, there's a lot more, and I believe now it flashed my mind, I will have to show the sequence to where we are. Right now, and this is not going to be fearful or, or excitable or whatever, right now, we are told that plans are afoot for something called a sun. The Lord, look, it's the same thing as that. Is it? Yeah, it is. There's some plan afoot. Meaning, believers, if you have not been preparing, this thing is going to hit so sudden and ferocious that your faith will faint and give up because the pressure will be so much. Brethren, preparation time is still available. The word of God is still there for us to see and understand. And like Simeon, to be filled with the spirit of God, that God can indicate in us what he wants to do. I conclude because time is obviously up, but I haven't heard a whistle, but I'm going to respect time rather than a whistle. I believe, brethren, I want you to understand you've come to solemn times. God has given the signs. Not that you're a prognosticator or predictor, but that it will drive you like Simeon and Anna to prayer night and day with fastings and like Daniel with supplication that your soul may escape when the conflagration of the last days occur. It is confrontation, page 180. Sorry, Maranatha. Maranatha. So there are two books, Confrontation, Maranatha is Maranatha. All right, I just want to pray quick at this time because I still want to recognize and respect the little time that we have. But I hope, brethren, that even though we've gone over it, that you be encouraged by the lives of those who have gone before. Oh, Father, what a wonderful Father you are. You have not left us in darkness, but by your word from your prophets which you have given. And we can see from very way back your people giving heed to your word and understanding your word were able always to escape the distractions that were threatened. They believed your word, surrendered to that word, and had that word and the experience, and therefore you were able to deliver them. We praise your name. And we thank you, Father, that we too are without excuse because you have given us your word. You have shown us the signs and the Sun, the moon, and the stars have already gone. And you're showing to us now that the abomination that makes desolate is virtually there, Lord, on holy ground. And it's time for your people, dear Lord, with prayer and fasting and supplications night and day, being filled by your Holy Spirit to be prepared, dear Father, for the events that will come suddenly upon this world. Right deeply upon your people's heart. And may they know that it's not about excitement, but it's about earnestness and urgency, dear Lord. And we beg you, Father, to hold, hold, hold the reins of strife onto your people as seed in their foreheads. Oh, may we give heed to your word this day. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name.